Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. Okay, we are beginning our lecture on big business and labor, and this is our background for this slideshow. This is a caricature of John Rockefeller, and John Rockefeller was an oil tycoon uh, throughout the 1800s into the 1900s, and here we see him in, uh, holding what we can tell is the White House in his hand. And he's looking at the White House. And you can't see the caption um, for this cartoon, but, it, but it's something like, what a funny little government here. And basically, this cartoon is communicating that Rockefeller, a uh, business tycoon, has our government in the palm of his hand. The presidency, the, uh, the, white, the presidency and also the Congress. Because in the back, we see the Capitol building. Uh, the seat of our Congress, with smokestacks coming out of it. And in the foreground, um, or in between the Capitol building and Rockefeller, we see numerous dozens, hundreds of oil uh, barrels. And so this is designed to show a rather negative opinion of Rockefeller, like he has too much power and has too much control over our government. And that's why it's a background for our lecture on... <laughs> Big business and labor in the late 1800s. The Rise of the Tycoon and the Union by Christopher W. Miller from VHS. I think that's it. Now, if we're going to talk about business in the late 1800s, the first thing we have to talk about is ra the railroads. It was one of the most important and influential industries in the late 1800s. And the U.S. government helped railroad companies by giving them huge land grants and loans. And this would put railroad companies in positions of power. Uh, they could control uh, farming in, for many respects because if they had the land and farmers wanted to use it, the farmers had to go to railroad companies to buy it from them. Also, of course, if farmers want to ship their goods from place to place, across, especially across country, they needed to go to railroads. Um, that was the only option. And so railroads could charge what they wanted to ship uh, the farmer's produce from one state to another, and the farmers had to pay it. They didn't have much of a choice because otherwise they wouldn't be able to sell their goods, uh, except locally. Now, one railroad executive who was especially powerful was George M. Pullman. And George M. Pullman created an entire town just for his company of workers. His company's workers. This was called Pullman Towns. Uh, in 1880, he bought 4,000 acres of land outside of Chicago for this purpose. He basically controlled his workers' lives in this town. And eventually, the whole experiment fell apart. Now, I'm going to show you a video here for about five minutes all about the failure of Pullman's town. And this is made from a YouTube channel called Who's Hoosier Woodworks, and I like this because the man making the, uh, the video puts his slides on, uh, puts his slides, uh, the sources for his slides um, on the video. So here is the failure of George Pullman's commercial utopia as told by the YouTube channel Hoosier, Hoosier Woodworks. It was an age of giants. George M. Pullman was a self-made tycoon, willing to take a chance on a dream. In 1880, he purchased 4,000 acres just south of Chicago. Lake Calumet on the east, Illinois Central Railroad on the west perfect place for a commercial utopia. 
build factories, and a town for the workers to make the homes comfortable and modern. Fresh air from Lake Calumet, sunshine, security, good schools, wonderful architecture everywhere. Workers applied by the thousands. Only the best were chosen. Healthy, happy workers to build the world's finest railroad cars and never strike. Walk to the plants together, work together, come home together, go to church together. The same basic pay and the same basic rent. The same food, the same clothes. Fourteen years in a row, Pullman was voted the world's most perfect town. In 1893, the Columbian World's Fair was held in Chicago. Pullman was a major attraction. Scholars from all over the world scrutinized the workers. How was the regimentation in their lives affecting their development? Was it a good life? Let's look at one of his slides here for a second. Conclusions of visitors to Pullman. They said the original planning and current administration of this town have reinforced the habits of respectability, including propriety and good manners, neatness of appearance, industriousness, and sobriety, sobriety, you know, hard industriousness, hardworking, sobriety, not drinking a lot, self-improvement through education and saving. 1893 was a bad year for business, a depression. Orders for Pullman cars plummeted. Not enough income to pay the expenses. Debt screaming to be paid. George had to tighten his belt. The Pullman workers were given big pay cuts, but their full rent had to be paid. Many were working every day and destitute. 1,000 families without food. 2,000 workers laid off and must leave their homes with nowhere to go. And no help from George the benefactor. He had become a feudal lord. If someone complained, they were fired. The workers defiantly walked off the job. George locked the doors. A lot of negativity on both sides. Eugene Debs called a nationwide strike in support of the Pullman workers. And many strikers were killed. When order was restored, a large number of Pullman workers had lost their jobs and homes love affair had ended. George. Findings of the Pullman Presidential Commission. Okay, this is the negative side of Pullman. The report strike found Pullman's paternalism partly to blame and Pullman's company town to be un-American. The aesthetic, spe aesthetic features are admired by visitors but have little money value to employees, especially when they lack bread. Aesthetic means the outside of things. So the buildings look nice, the town looked nice, but that doesn't mean much to employees when they don't have food on the table. They don't have the necessary salary or money to survive. George Pullman became a reviled caricature of an unjust tycoon. Three years later, he was dead. The homes in the town were were sold. The 1898, the Illinois Supreme Court forced the Pullman Company to divest ownership of the town, give up ownership of the town, and the neighborhood was reabsorbed into the uh, fabric of the city and annexed to Chicago.
soon sold off for private ownership. The experiment was over. Okay, so that was Tom Reed from the YouTube channel Hoosier Woodcraft. So Pullman basically controlled his workers' lives in this town and it was eventually and ultimately to his demise, or the demise of his company. I have Pullman on the left there, and then you can see um, the town very picturesque uh, there on the right. Railroads were so important that they even affected time. The system of time zones we use today was created in part to unify time standards across the country so that train conductors wouldn't have to worry about so many time changes as they traveled. And so now we have time zones around the world, but we specifically have time zones in the United States. Uh, in Ohio, you know, we live in the eastern time zone, and then we have the central time zone in yellow on that map you can see there, the mountain time zone, and the Pacific time zone followed by the Alaskan time zone, and finally the Hawaiian time zone. But perhaps the greatest achievement of the railroad industry, at least in our history, in U.S. history, was the Transcontinental Railroad. It was completed in 1869 and had numerous positive but also negative effects on the U.S. It cut travel time across the country from six months to ten days. It allowed produce to be shipped quickly from west to east. The farming, especially in the west in California, it couldn't have gotten back to the east in time before it spoiled before the railroad. But the railroad allowed it to do so. And manufactured goods could now be shipped from east to west very easily. Um, it was a great benefit for business, both agricultural business and manufacturing business. It allowed for the increased settlement of the west as railroads moved uh, west. Uh, and as the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, more railroads would branch off from that main, r the main railroad and allow for other towns to be developed. Denver, for example, was a railroad town. The Native American way of life, though, on the Great Plains ended. Um, as the railroads came west, the buffalo were hunted to near extinction. And for many Plains Indians, that was their way of life, not just a food source. Um, Many workers were killed or injured on the job. Um, it was very dangerous work. And uh, as the, great, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, hundreds of workers suffered. Chinese workers especially suffered from discrimination, those who worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. Here's a very famous picture of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And it shows the two uh, main railroad companies um, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific m meeting in Promontory, Utah to uh, connect, the two, connect the two branches of the railroad. But in this picture, no Chinese workers, even though they played a great role in building the railroad, were featured. Only white men. Before we go on to the government's policy towards big business, we're going to watch a little video about the Transcontinental Railroad. In early May 1869, the competing companies neared the north end of the Great Salt Lake and the day of completion. Company VIPs and government dignitaries traveled by private car to Promontory, while the track layers literally worked their way to the finish line, stringing the telegraph wires as they went. May 10, 1869, under brilliant blue skies, all gathered at a recently tossed together settlement in northern Utah, and the whole country listened in for 
for news of Promontory. rails are almost touching at this point and the telegraph wires are going from promontory summit out across the deserts across the plains and the mountains and they're going to the settled places san francisco sacramento new york boston washington and it's as if there's a gigantic electrical circuit linking the nation together for the first time in history in every city and town in the United States. It was like there was a collective indrawn breath taken. signal flashed across the United States. A cannon based over the Pacific and one over the Atlantic went off simultaneously, warning the world what was about to happen. Church bells and fire alarms in every city and town in the nation went off. Crowds cheered, fireworks went off, parades began, thousands of people kneeling in prayer. It was as if the entire country was suddenly linked at this moment. is finished, wrote a Union Pacific surveyor who was there that day. This great and mighty enterprise that spans a continent with iron and unites two oceans. The future is coming, and fast too. Okay, so that's a little background on the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Again, a very great achievement with both positive and negative consequences for people in the United States. Now we're going to look at government's policy toward business. And we have to understand that during the latter half of the 19th century, if the U.S. government didn't help business grow, it certainly did not interfere with it. And how do you justify the government not interfering? This is through the theory of social Darwinism. And you might be familiar with Charles Darwin's theory of biological evolution, the belief that um, more advanced life forms evolve from simpler life forms. Okay? And, and according to the biological evolution, it's stated that nature, in nature, the strong survive and adapt to their environment while the weak die out. And under this theory, the business world is the same. Okay? And so government should not interfere with the natural order of things. If a business is going to fail, the government should let it fail. If a business is going to succeed, the government should let business succeed. Again, here's a picture. Charles Darwin on the left, the man who came up with the theory of biological evolution, and the idea uh, illustrated here by a Little Simpsons cartoon. Um, and this would seem to justify the belief in laissez-faire economics. What is laissez-faire economics? Well, laissez-faire is French for hands off. And in this belief, business is not regulated by the government, but allowed to develop and grow on its own. Again, natural law forbids intervention. We, we can't stop the weak businesses from failing, even if it means people losing jobs. We have to let them fail and die out. Um, the strong businesses will pick up the slack or other businesses will develop in their place. Um, again, this is all part of government's policy towards big business in the latter half of the 19th century. Here's a little cartoon I like to use uh, to uh, illustrate this. See the little guy here saying, yeah, it's time for the lazy fair. And the little green guy comes and says, don't you mean laissez-faire? Blank stare. Laissez-faire means a hands-off government. There is no such thing as a lazy fair. And besides, if there was a lazy fair, then they would be too lazy to even set it up. Ha, ha, ha. All right. And now we go to Mr. Jackson with The Rise of the Tycoon. Take it away, Mr. Jackson. Okay. Hello, class. It's Mr. Jackson here. And we're going to talk about the rise of tycoons today. Simply defined, a tycoon is somebody who has extreme wealth and power. 
Laissez-faire economics would allow people to become tycoons. Laissez-faire, that's something you should have heard last year in world history. You're going to hear it now in U.S. history, and you'll hear it in government too because it still talks about hands-off government, hands-off big business. So the government did not do anything, try to regulate it or interfere with big business. And because of that, we have tycoons, the rise of tycoons. One such tycoon was Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie's immigrant child from Scotland would use new strategies to move him to the top of the steel industry. There's a picture of Carnegie right there. He would use the practice of vertical integration in which he would buy out all the suppliers in order to control raw material in the transportation system. He would also originate the process of horizontal integration in which he would buy out the competitors' companies and merge them together. These two processes would give Carnegie a monopoly or complete control over his industry, which today in society and in our business in, in the United States, monopolies are illegal, but it seems like here lately in America we're looking the other way because right now the cable companies are almost is down to one. There's a couple other countries, a couple other businesses that are almost down to one. So I don't know. They're not, not going to say we're laissez-faire in it right now, but we're coming real close to it. We're going back to it to the way it was when these tycoons were on the rise. Here's a uh, demonstration of horizontal and vertical integration. As you can see, taking McDonald's, for instance, and their competitors, across the top you can see Burger King, Taco Bell, and Wendy's. If McDonald's would buy out every one of those, that means they used a horizontal way integration to buy out all their competitors to do away with them. They'd be all by themselves. Can't do that today, but it's coming to that in some places. Now, they would still have to pay, even if they bought all the competitors, they still have to pay for their chicken, their potatoes, their cow for their, for their hamburgers and stuff. So then you could turn around and do it vertically. And you can see there below McDonald's, the bigger one, you can see the cow, the potatoes, and the chicken. If they bought all of those, now they basically have a monopoly on everything. They wouldn't pay anybody anything. Everything would come to them because they owned it all. They owned every part of their business, which is called a monopoly and is illegal, but there's some things going on that happen today. So those are the things, and those are important. Vertical integration, horizontal integration, and monopoly. Those are all some of your vocabulary words probably off of your crossword puzzle that you did in class already. <laughs> robber barons. Some tycoons would be known as robber barons because of their great wealth and their abuse of the public. A lot of them were because they didn't care about the public. They just cared about their self-making money. Oil industry ty tycoon John D. Rockefeller, he was from Cleveland, was one such man. Rockefeller would create the Standard Oil Company of Ohio. By 1880, it would control 90% of the oil refining business. Rockefeller kept much of his money. Now, can anybody think of Standard Oil Company, what that is today? It's a gas station. There's one on Maple Avenue. There's two of them, actually, on Maple Avenue. Anybody know? Anybody? 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 Going once, going twice. BP, that's what Standard Oil is today, guys. You see the BP station? John D. Rockefeller, that's his company. There you can see John D. Rockefeller as the young man and the old man. Remember, he's from Cleveland, so Mr. Miller idolizes him because he's from Cleveland. Banker and industrial J.P. Morgan would create a monopoly. Remember what monopoly means, guys, where you control all aspects of business. He was a holding company, and company whose only purposes was to buy out stock of other companies. How he would form the United States Steel Corporation in 1901, which is a good example of a holding company. So what he did, he just bought stocks and took over the companies that way. He didn't buy out the competition. He just bought the company itself. You didn't buy it by holding stocks. You own part of the company. He owned most of the stock, so he owned the company. And there he is, J.P. Morgan. Which, all these guys you're going to see, I know Mr. Miller, I know if you're in my class, we're watching movies from the History Channel about these tycoons. So you'll see these guys, if you haven't seen them already, you'll see them shortly in some of the uh, movies that will be shown in class. William Vanderbilt was a tycoon in the railroad industry. He would give special rates to his favorite customers, bribe officials when they found out about the tactic and fought regulation. So another way of trying to cheat the system. There he is right there. Henry Ford. Everybody should know what Henry Ford was famous for. Wasn't really a robber baron, but was one of the last great industrials of his era. 
He didn't invent the car or the assembly line, but he developed both and made them in common s- sites in U.S. industry. His Model T car was the first affordable and reliable car for the masses in 1908. Henry Ford's idea was to put a car in everyone's garage, and the cheapest his car was, he did. And the thing is, I wish cars were today were so simple as his Model T could actually work on them. Today, you can't even touch a car. There you can see Henry Ford, and there's his Model T. Honestly, considering how old those are, there's still a lot of his cars around today. You can find them, especially here in Ohio. There's a Model T club I know of for a fact, and there's still a lot of fully restored original part Model Ts here in Ohio. (laughs) Now, because of the tycoons and robber barons, we have the abuses of big business. In order to cut costs and maximize profits, owners gave their workers few benefits. Hours were long, 12 to 16-hour days were normal. Factories called for seven-day work, work weeks. Industries were com- injuries were common. So looking at this, how would you feel, guys, if you had to, you know, you come to school now about seven and a half hours. Add on five more hours, doing something you don't want to do, working as hard as you can in places that's hot in the summer, cold in the winter, okay, 12 or 16 hours a day for pennies on the dollar. What do you think? Yeah, I didn't think so. And on top of that, no days off, seven days a week, no Sunday, no Saturday off, working every day, all right? And then injuries were common. So if you get hurt and can't come to work, you don't get paid. If you get hurt and can't work anymore, so what? I'll hire somebody else. There's no workers' comp. There's no unions right now. There's nothing to protect you. So if you didn't, couldn't come to work, oh, well, if you couldn't come to work a lot, I'd just fire you and find somebody else, no problem. These are the problems and the abuses that big business did during this time. Child labor was acceptable, which can you imagine? You guys in here are, are 14, 15 years old. Could you imagine if you have a brother or sister in elementary school, them going to work for 12 or 15 hours a day or 16 hours a day? That was common. Things such as vacation, sick leave and injury, compensation, unemployment compensation were unheard of. So what they're saying is you didn't go on vacation. If you got sick, you didn't make any money. If you were injured, so what? I replaced you. There's no compensation if you got hurt on the job and pay you. And if I fired you, you couldn't collect unemployment and get paid. You would just be out of work and have no money. So how, how does that sound for you guys? All these things are the problems and the reason why labor unions and the things of today are how we have workers' compensation and sick leave and vacation time and regulations for child uh, workers and things like that we have today because of the abuses that went on during this time period. Here's a picture of the Breaker Boys. They look happy to you. You got one smile out of the group. The rest of them look pretty like, eh, I'm kind of tired. And these are the guys who worked. They were a child. They were probably 10, 11, 12 years old working in a coal mine 12, 16 hours a day. So how would you like to be underground, don't see any sun, for years on time? Because basically you go down, you could go down at 6 in the morning before the sun rose and come up out of there after the sun set. How would you feel about that? And these are what these Breaker Boys right here and these are some reasons why we have child labor laws today to protect you guys i want to thank you guys for listening to me next you'll hear your favorite teacher mr miller see ya and here is our next slide thank you mr jackson for your help um we want to talk about labor unions and how they form to protect workers mr jackson has talked about in the earlier slides about the bad conditions workers had to deal with. And naturally, eventually, enough was enough. And workers joined together to protest and and fight back and and work for better working conditions, better wages, better lives overall. They formed what we call labor unions. These are organizations designed to protect the rights of workers who have the same jobs. The National Labor Union, which was founded in 1866, was the first labor union in the United States. And eventually, two major types of unions would be formed. These were craft, or we sometimes call trade unions, and industrial unions. So what were these? Well, the craft unions would mainly include skilled workers. The first one of note was Samuel Gompers' uh, American Federation of Labor in 1886. And here we see a, a picture of Samuel Gompers. Also, we have the industrial unions. These unions felt that both skilled and and unskilled workers should be included. 
And the first such union of this type was the American Railway Union, started by Eugene B. Debs in 1894, who was already mentioned earlier when we were talking about the Pullman strike. And here's a picture of Eugene B. Debs, a very powerful union man for his time. So what did unions use to get what they wanted? They used strikes. And strikes are where workers would refuse to do their jobs until conditions changed. Industry and the government would respond harshly to strikes because they could disrupt the economy. Uh, why would you think, why would the government care if a company went on strike? Well, government collects taxes from those companies. And if companies aren't doing business, that means less tax money to go into the government's coffers. The Great Strike of 1877 was a result of railway workers protesting a wage cut. And it caused a shutdown of freight train and some passenger train traffic all over the nation for a week. Think about it. Businesses can't get their goods to market if they have no way to get them there. And freight trains do that. Even today, freight trains are a major, major method for companies getting their goods back and forth. Even more so than big semi-trucks. Also, passenger train traffic was shut down for a week. So that means you can't get to work. You can't get to um, shut you can't go shopping you can't get from point a to point b that has a very negative effect on the economy the strike would encourage labor leaders and other strikes so the 1877 strike was able to convince people that this was a way to get what you needed often though these strikes would turn violent for example the haymarket affair the homestead strike the pullman company strike which we already looked at earlier in the late 1800s would have violent ends. And in a minute, I'll show you a video about the homestead strike. But what we have to understand is that most of the time, the government would be sent in to break these strikes, to end these strikes, um, and to bring calm back to the area. Owners would crack down on strikers. Um, they would hire private security companies to physically break up the protesters. And so you'd have little wars going on between protesters, the strikers, the labor unions, and the, phys uh, the private security companies, the owners had hired, the tycoons like Rockefeller and Carnegie, and uh, Carnegie's partner Henry Clay Frick would hire to break them up and to shut down the strikes. Um, one woman who helped organize unions for the strikes was Mary Harris Jones, and she brought attention especially to child labor and bad working conditions. And here's a picture of Mary Harris Jones. I want to go back for a second, and I want to examine the Homestead Strike, because this is one of the more famous strikes in US history. And it involved Andrew Carnegie's um, uh, steel or organizations. In the early months of 1892, tensions inside the Homestead Steel Mill reach a boiling point. Carnegie and Frick set aside their differences to battle the workers' union together. The unions wanted higher wages, shorter hours. Conditions were perfectly appalling. The workers were simply cogs in the wheel. They were almost non-human. Carnegie and Frick reunited on the idea that they were going to get rid of the union. Carnegie puts Frick in charge of day-to-day -day negotiations. Get your men back to work. A decision that will have deadly results. Frick was interested in driving down prices, and the Amalgamated Association was the thing he hated more than anything. His approach to the steel union is simple. Workers' rates must follow the selling price of the product. In 1892, Carnegie and Frick sent a message to the amalgamated union at Homestead that the wages had to fall and that the mill was going to operate non-union in the future. We're brothers in this. We have to stay together so our families can eat. If Frick thinks we're gonna back down, he doesn't know the Homestead Boys. Are you with me? Yeah! And we're gonna strike. 
going to strike, I say we break it, bring in all new people. Carnegie certainly wanted to get rid of the Union, but he thought they could do it without this confrontational approach that Frick was advocating. I say we simply starve them out, close the plant, and when they can barely feed themselves, they'll come back to us, desperate. We get what we want and they keep their jobs. The plant would be closed for months. We lose millions in profit. Investors will start pulling out. You know where I stand. Long term, Henry. Think long term. And what would eventually happen in the long term was that Frick would uh, try to break the strike by hiring uh, the Pinkerton Security Company to do so. And he sent them in, and it, it was bloody. People died. Um, but this was only one example of uh, a strike w which turned violent. Eventually, the government does interfere, and laissez-faire economics is definitely not completely abandoned, but maybe partially ignored. The U.S. Congress would try to protect farmers, for example, from railroads. Remember, we talked about how powerful the railroads are were in the early part of the lecture. This was done in 1877 by 1887, sorry, by passing the Interstate Commerce Act, which would allow the federal government to regulate trade between the states. And this act would create the Interstate Commerce Commission. This may not have an immediate effect, but this would have an effect down the line and give the federal government the power to stop people from gouging farmers and other businesses who wanted to transport their goods. The U.S. government also tried to stop abuses of business through the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. And this was designed to break up trust, which, you know, mono monopolies. A um, couple presidents, especially William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt, who got the nickname Trust Buster, would u try to break up these trusts, break up these monopolies so there would be more competition and prices could be uh, pushed down and people, uh, consumers could get better deals. The Supreme Court, though, would usually throw out the cases brought to it under the act, however. And the prosecutors would eventually give up. And it wasn't until the early 1900s, past the 1890s, when Roosevelt and Taft would have some success with their trust busting, as it was said. But who made up the unions and who did all the work? Well, in a future lesson, we're going to look at immigration and its effect on the United States because immigrants would form the backbone of these unions and these companies. Well, that'll do it for the lecture on big business and labor. Uh, I hope you got enough information uh, from it. As you can see, I'm enjoying the beautiful fall weather here uh, at my son's football practice. I hope you're watching this uh, video in uh, similar weather. <laughs> I hope not in the middle of winter. Um, Hope you guys have a great day. Keep uh, following the channel. Click the subscribe button below so that you can be updated when new videos are posted. Peace out. Mr. Miller out.